up to now I've had eight heart attacks. Oh I've had colitis for four years. Mm. I have had edema for about 20 years. I was diagnosed with diabetes nine months ago. Well, yeah, I thought I was going to die. Okay, there's a catalogue of ailments here. Can they be cured? Maybe a change of mood music. 160 pounds. I've seen a 50% at least reduction. I first noticed my edema going away uh, about four days into the smoothies. I thought I was you know, just never going to reverse. Well, here it is six months later, and I don't have cancer anymore. What? Don't have cancer anymore? Well, it can't be the mood music that did it. So what has cured all of these people of their ailments? And the raw food drew and pulled excess mucus out of... That's right eating raw vegetables and fruit. Now, I don't want to dismiss the idea that eating fruit and veg is good for you. Just about every doctor will tell you this. And we're all aware that a diet rich in the sort of things you find in processed food, like sugar, salt and fat, can cause everything from diabetes to arterial sclerosis. So changing to a fruit and veg diet certainly helps alleviate these problems. But the author of this video goes much further, documenting 37 cases of a fruit and veg diet curing everything from psoriasis to cancer, and further still. It is as natural for a human to be healthy as it is for water to flow downward. Being unwell is about as unnatural as for water to flow backwards. So who's making such ridiculous claims? Sorry, uh, this is Valia Butenko and her belief that sickness and disease simply wouldn't happen if only we ate nothing but raw vegetables and fruit. Look, see, she can run uphill. Is promoted in a website I've come across before, Natural News. Without apparently bothering to check any of the testimonials presented in her video, Natural News stated that they were documented and true. But then natural news has form when it comes to spreading junk science and theories that scientists are conspiring to harm us all. Here's one that catches the eye. Exposed! The Centre for Disease Control deliberately manipulated, covered up scientific data showing link between vaccines containing mercury and autism. Now this has been in the news over the last few years, so the discovery that one of the institutions at the heart of promoting vaccines has been covering up a link between the vaccines and autism is, well, news-breaking stuff. So why haven't I seen it anywhere except natural news? Well, as usual, if we want to check a fact, what do we do? Find, Find out, out where, where it comes, comes from. from. <laughs> That's right. So let's check where this claim comes from. What's the source? Apparently, the information comes from an organization called the Coalition for Mercury-Free Drugs, COMED. They obtained a copy of an email from the CDC discussing a Danish study that was to be published in the journal Pediatrics. The Danish study looked at the prevalence of autism following the withdrawal of a preservative called thimerosal in 1992. If this mercury compound really did cause autism, we ought to see a drop in the number of cases after it was withdrawn, right? And according to COMED, we do. Documents obtained via the Freedom of Information Act show that CDC officials were aware of Danish data indicating a connection between removing thimerosal and a decline in autism rates. Despite this knowledge, these officials allowed a 2003 article to be published in Pediatrics that excluded this information. Before we go on, what is this information that's been excluded? Well, it was the latest figures for autism rates in Denmark at that time covering 2001. And according to the email, these show a continuation of the decline in autism rates. So according to ComEd, autism rates dropped after the vaccine was withdrawn, and figures showing that this drop continued were deliberately excluded. This would seem to be slam-dunk evidence of a conspiracy of government and science of the highest order. Uh, until you look at the figures ComEd is talking about. Remember how it said rates of autism dropped in Denmark when the vaccine was withdrawn in 1992? Well, guess what? Turns out they did the opposite. They rose. And remember that decline that was talked about? Well, that didn't happen until around 1999, seven years after the vaccine was withdrawn. And the 2001 figure that was simply a continuation of the decline? Well, that was nine years after the vaccine was withdrawn and therefore hardly relevant to the study. Leaving it out didn't change the picture at all. 
Now, the folks at Comed weren't suggesting that the figures prior to 2001 had been manipulated. They simply didn't tell us there was a seven-year gap between the withdrawal of a vaccine and the supposedly linked decline in autism. In fact, if one looks at the graph through the eyes of a witless person, one who understands very little about cause and effect, one could more readily conclude that thimerosal prevents autism, because as soon as it's withdrawn, autism rates soar. But of course no researcher would make such a sweeping and unsubstantiated inference because science doesn't work like that. But it seems it's perfectly okay to draw the opposite conclusion. When I started in medicine, the uh, rate of autism among children in the United States was about 1 in 10,000. And now the rate of autism is 1 in 100. Now, there is no way that could be a genetic problem. So it has to be an environmental problem. So the issue is, what has happened over the last 25 to 30 years to cause this epidemic of autism? And so the only thing that really has changed is the number of vaccines that are giving, that are being recommended and are being given to children. Yes, the only thing that's changed in 25 years is the increased use of vaccines. No wonder people always tell me I'm living in the past. Look, Nancy, I know you're a doctor, but you really suck at analysing cause and effect. There are thousands of environmental factors that have changed over the last 25 years, and any one or more of them could be causing autism. And similarly, anecdotal evidence means diddly squat. I had a chance to interview parents. Every single parent said the same thing. I had a normal developing child until the day of the vaccine. We we sat down with one local family who shared their story on how they believe their two children developed autism after they were vaccinated. I want you to see what these parents are going through with these kids. Now, we're dealing with people in distress here, whose children are suffering horribly, and I have to show some compassion and tread rather delicately through this subject. But I'm not going to, because I think a lot of parents are selfish blockheads who are not only putting their children at risk, but other children as well. Of course I'm very sorry for the suffering their children are going through, but that's no excuse for spreading ignorance through the media. Using pictures of suffering children to push a tenuous scientific case is an old tactic beloved of activists, the media and politicians. If they don't have any evidence, just show us a picture of a suffering child and play on our misplaced feelings of guilt. A number of studies have been done into the alleged link between vaccinations and autism, and like the Danish study, they all come up empty. The only link is circumstantial, which is that the vaccination shots are given at about the same time autism diagnosis becomes possible. This is where cause and effect come in. It's rather like saying, my daughter received the cervical cancer vaccine when she was 12, and soon hair was sprouting under her armpits. My son was given a tetanus shot when he was 13, and it caused him to be moody, sullen, and made a mess of his bedsheets. There's no reason to suppose that autism was brought on at the time it was diagnosed. According to this study in the International Journal of Developmental Neuroscience, many lines of evidence suggest that the underlying alterations in the brain occur long before the period when symptoms become obvious. Studies of the behaviour of children in the first year of life demonstrate that symptoms are often detectable in the first six months. The environmental factors known to increase the risk of autism have critical periods of action during embryogenesis. In other words, just because a child might be diagnosed at three years old, doesn't mean he suddenly caught autism. The evidence suggests autism might have developed in the womb, and it's just not diagnosed until three years. There's no doubt there is a risk associated with vaccinations. About one in a hundred thousand children will get a severe allergic reaction because of it, and there are other side effects. But we take these risks because we know that the risk associated with not giving the vaccine is worse. Children do die from measles, mumps and rubella, even in developed countries. And in developing countries, measles alone is one of the biggest childhood killers. In the year 2000, nearly three quarters of a million children died from contracting measles. And yes, here we can use pictures of suffering children to illustrate just how bad these viruses are, because the science of vaccination isn't tenuous, it's backed by overwhelming evidence. An effective measles vaccine was introduced into the United States in 1963. By 2000, endemic measles had been eradicated in the U.S. 
And when a United Nations vaccination program got underway worldwide, measles deaths plunged 75% from three-quarters of a million in 2000 to 164,000 in 2008. Mumps also saw a dramatic decline when the MMR vaccine was introduced, and this is what happened to cases of rubella in the United States when a vaccine was introduced in 1969. MMR vaccines have been so successful that a few years ago the World Health Organization thought it was on track to eradicate all three diseases globally, just as a worldwide vaccination program had eradicated smallpox. But then came the scare campaign. It began soon after the publication of this paper in The Lancet in 1998. It's actually not a very significant paper, and it doesn't make any extraordinary claims. Andrew Wakefield did a study of just 12 children and concluded that it's possible there might be a connection between the MMR vaccine and the autism these kids developed. Why so? Well, he suggested that maybe measles virus was retained in the gut, where it may have caused an infection that might have led to autism. But it had absolutely no physical or statistical evidence to support it. It was certainly interesting, but no one who read this paper could have concluded that there was any link between autism and vaccinations. Except, of course, people who were against these vaccinations and fed that line to journalists. Vaccine-induced autism is very controversial in the medical community. A study done by doctors and researchers in England in 1998 and more recently in 2006 suggested that there is a link between the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine and autism. The study suggests that the preservatives and ingredients in the vaccines could be causing autism in a significant number of children. But the quotes shown here don't come from Wakefield's paper. So who did this reporter get to interpret the Wakefield paper for him? It was a leading advocate for the link between vaccines and autism, David Thrower. Eight years after Wakefield's study was published, an American doctor, Stephen Walker, also claimed a possible link between MMR and autism, this time in nothing more than a poster presentation at the International Meeting for Autism Research. But that didn't stop the media making outrageous claims for it, not only hyping the results, but also the status of the study and the support it had. By this time, there was more than enough evidence gathered over the years to convince researchers there was no link between vaccinations and autism, but these well-documented studies were ignored in favour of the snappy headline. Now, where have we heard that before? I'm going to look at the role of the media in this story more closely when I do a future video in my Science and the Media series because the vaccination issue is one where they royally stuffed up. Not just by failing to research or report accurately, but by seeing science, like politics, as a subject that has to have two sides, bending over backwards and moving the goalposts to give a belief without evidence equal weight to scientific studies backed by overwhelming evidence is not balance. It's bias. In no way are we saying that you're, you should not have your children vaccinated. We just want to provide you the information you need to know to make an informed choice. Yes, we report you decide has a nice ring to it. But if the report is crap, then the decision based on it will be crap. And encouraging people to read the research for themselves may sound balanced, but let's face it, they won't read the research. They'll just Google a few words and read and believe whatever crappy websites pop up first. No wonder that in the wake of this internet campaign and the media hype, so many parents stopped vaccinating their children in the first decade of the 21st century. That wasn't reversed even after it was found that Wakefield had faked his results and his meagre research was discredited. Once the internet has been surfed and the conspiracy belief is planted, nothing, it seems, can change it. The result? Having become diseases of the past in most developed countries, by 2004, mumps was back, and soon after, so was measles. The Daily Mail, fearless when it came to telling parents five years earlier that the MMR vaccine might be dangerous for their children, now had to ask the inevitable question, why is measles on the rise? And the inevitable answer, just blame the French. Actually, the real answer came in the story. A lot of British parents had stopped having their kids vaccinated, so when they went on holiday to France, where parents were also not vaccinating their kids, they were exposed to the virus and the children caught it. And when these British children got home, they spread it among their unvaccinated friends. 
Soon, I'm sure, we'll see enraged Daily Mail editorials asking why British parents haven't been vaccinating their kids for the past five years. Well, here's why. If more and more children stop getting MMR vaccines, cases of measles, mumps and rubella will soar. Simple as that. Worst of all, we've come so close to eradicating all three diseases worldwide, and now we're deliberately and methodically taking the first steps backwards.